In this video, we will be building a fully integrated financial statement model, otherwise known as a three statement model. It is perhaps the most important process you can learn as an aspiring financial analyst. This framework will serve as the foundation for most thorough financial analysis. It will also help you understand how a business creates and consumes cash, and consequently how a business creates and destroys value. As you watch the instructional video, I would encourage you to download the file and build the financial model yourself. We will follow the same sequence outlined in the preceding video, titled Overview of the Process. Only it will be applied to a more detailed template. But notice that the tabs in this workbook match the sequence described previously. On the first tab, we will input historical data. Then we will move on to the next step, which is to project the three financial statements, the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. And then finally, we will conclude the process with our supporting schedules, including the debt schedule and the PP&E schedule. And with that introduction, we can go ahead and get started with step one. The first step in building a financial model is to input the historical data. And in this example, we will be using two years of historical data from the income statement and the balance sheet. To populate the model, first select the cell you would like to fill. Press the equal sign, and then using Control and Page Up, tab over to the corresponding cell, and press Enter. You can then select the adjacent cell and paste this across with Control R. We will then repeat this process for all cells on the income statement with a pale yellow background and blue text, as that indicates an input. It's a repetitive process, so I'm going to edit most of it out and then come back so that we can hard code the formulas. And now that the historical data from the income statement has been included in the model, we'll go back to the top and write formulas for the rows that remain empty. Because we do not have the revenue figure for the preceding year. Revenue growth for the first year of historical data is simply not available, so input in A. In the second year, we will input the quotient of current year revenue over the previous year, minus 1. Next, input cost of goods sold as a percent of revenue. And when you select revenue, use F4 to lock the row 7. Then select the adjacent cell and press Control R. Next, gross profit is equal to revenue less cost of goods sold. Paste the formula across with Control R. And now since we fixed the cell reference for revenue, we can select both of these cells, press Control C, and paste this formula for gross profit as a percent of sales and operating expenses as a percent of sales. And you'll note that in each case, because we anchored row 7, the formula still links back to revenue. Next, we have operating income, which is equal to gross profit less operating expenses. Again, paste the formula across with Control R. Next, pre tax income is equal to operating income less interest expense. Since the tax rate on a historical income statement is not always meaningful, here input NM for not meaningful. And finally, we have net income which is equal to pre-tax income, less income tax expense. And because EBITDA is so frequently referenced in financial models, I included a gray shaded area at the bottom of the income statement to calculate EBITDA for the year. To do that, we'll link to EBIT above. And then use the sum function in row 33 to add back depreciation and amortization. And with this step complete, we can move on to inputting historical data for the balance sheet. 
So here we will start with cash. But first I'll scroll down to provide a better view of the balance sheet. Okay, so as before, press equal and then use control and page up to tab over to the balance sheet and select the corresponding cell. Now before we press enter, notice that here we have an array of inputs all adjacent to each other. That measures four cells tall and two across. This will make our job a little easier. Press enter, then select the adjacent cell with shift and the right arrow key. Press control R. But now what we can also do is again press shift and the down arrow key and control D. And the takeaway here is that having input cells adjacent to each other can reduce the number of steps required to populate a template. As before, the rest of the process is pretty repetitive. So I'll duplicate these steps for the remaining inputs and then come back for the formulas. And now, as before, we'll revisit the top of the balance sheet and input formulas for the rows that remain empty. Total current assets, as you might imagine, is equal to the sum of all current assets. Next, total assets is equal to the sum of total current assets plus property, plant, and equipment. Next, for total current liabilities, we will sum accounts payable, line of credit, and current maturities of long-term debt. Total liabilities is then equal to total current liabilities plus long-term debt net of current maturities. Next, we have total equity, which is equal to the sum of common stock, additional paid-in capital, and retained earnings. And then in row 65, we will sum total liabilities and total equity. And then finally, here at the bottom, every balance sheet should have a check to make sure that your total assets are equal to your total liabilities and equity. And by subtracting one from the other, so long as the difference is zero, you know that your balance sheet balances. And with that, we're done inputting the historical data. The next step is to start projecting the financial statements, and we'll get started with the income statement. This will require that we develop some assumptions about growth and profitability. The assumptions used to project financial models are absolutely critical, but because we're focusing on the mechanics and process of building a model, we're going to keep them simple. So to project revenue, we will assume a growth rate of 10% year over year. Highlight the cells in the projected period and press Ctrl R to paste that value across. Then we will input the formula for revenue in the current period, which is equal to revenue in the previous period times one plus your growth rate. As before, select the cells in the projected period and press Control R. But before we move on, keep in mind that we're building this from scratch. So we need to format our inputs accordingly. Press Alt H H and then use the arrow keys to select a pale yellow background. And then Alt H F C to select the color blue for text. Next, we can move on to cost of goods sold. To project cost of goods sold, we'll take the average of cost of goods sold as a percent of sales for the two historical periods. And note that we have fixed these references with F4. So we will be using the average from the historical periods for the entire projected period. Select the cells in the projected period, press Control R. And to calculate cost of goods sold, multiply revenue by cost of goods sold as a percent of sales in the current period. Gross profit is equal to revenue less cost of goods sold. 
and then we'll express this same figure as a percent of sales. Then select both, highlight the projected period, and press Ctrl R. For operating expenses or SGNA, we'll take the same approach we use for cost of goods sold. Again, press F4 to fix cell references, close print, and press Enter. It follows that to calculate operating expenses, we'll link to revenue at the top and multiply by operating expenses as a percent of sales in the current period. Next, select operating expenses and operating expenses as a percent of sales. Select the projected period and press Ctrl R. To calculate operating income, select gross profit and subtract operating expenses. Interest expense will be calculated on the debt schedule below. So for now, we'll just highlight it purple with Alt H H and then use the arrow keys to select a shade of purple. And this simply serves as a reminder to revisit this row once we've developed the debt schedules below. Next, for pre-tax income, link to operating income, and subtract interest expense. Again, select cells in the projected period and press Ctrl R. For income tax expense, we're going to assume a tax rate of 35%. And then we can quickly format this as an input with Alt H H and then use the arrow keys to select the pale yellow background and Alt H F C to change the text color to blue. Next, calculate income tax expense by linking to pre-tax income and multiplying by your tax rate. And then here in row 28, we have net income, which is equal to pre-tax income less income tax expense. Highlight all cells in the projected period and press Control R. And finally, we have the calculation for EBITDA at the bottom of the income statement. Recall that EBIT links to the model above. So we can paste the contents of this cell across with Control R. Depreciation has not yet been calculated, so much like interest expense, we will add a purple background as a reminder to revisit this row once the property plant and equipment schedule has been built. Amortization will be introduced in a future model. For now, input zero and paste this value across. And as a last step, we can take the formula for EBITDA, which is the sum of EBIT depreciation, and amortization. Select the projected period and press Control R to paste the formula across. And as you'll note, with the exception of interest expense, which will pull from the debt schedule, and depreciation, which will pull from the property plant and equipment schedule, we now have a projected income statement and we can move on to the balance sheet. If you're building the model yourself as we work through the video, which I highly recommend, keep in mind that you can stay on one tab which will challenge you to get everything right the first time. Otherwise, with each new step, you can proceed to the next tab. And in this way, you won't have any minor errors carry over. So now let's scroll down and take a look at the balance sheet. Before we can address the projected period, we need to develop a set of assumptions that relate to working capital accounts. Let's start with what is known as days sales outstanding, but what we will refer to as AR days for accounts receivable days. Accounts receivable represents the sum of invoice balances due to the company. So think of accounts receivable days as the average number of days it takes the company to collect payment after a sale. The formula is your accounts receivable balance divided by the quotient of revenue and the number of days in a year. Press enter, highlight the adjacent cell and press control R. Next, we have days inventory outstanding. 
which we will shorten to inventory days. This is the average number of days a company holds its inventory before selling it. The formula is your inventory balance in that period divided by the quotient of your cost of goods sold over the number of days in a year. Next we have days payable outstanding, which we have shortened to AP days for accounts payable days. This represents the average number of days the company takes to pay its suppliers. The formula for AP days is your accounts payable balance in this period divided by the quotient of cost of goods sold over the number of days in the year. And for the projected period, we're going to make a simple assumption that the average from our two historical periods will hold true for the projected period. So here, press F4 three times to effectively anchor the column, close paren, press Enter. And since we only anchored the column, you can use Control D to paste this formula down. Then select all three values in the first projected period and use Control R to paste across. And with these metrics projected, we can return to the top of the balance sheet. And as you've probably noticed, so that this doesn't turn into a formatting exercise, I left the rows that will pull from other financial statements or supporting schedules shaded purple already, which is why cash which will link to the cash flow statement, is shaded purple. To calculate accounts receivable, link to revenue, divide by 365, and then multiply by the accounts receivable days figure below. Next, we have inventory, which is calculated by taking the cost of goods sold, dividing by 365, and multiplying by the value for inventory days below. And in this model, to limit the number of variables, we're going to straight line prepaid expenses. Finally, for total current assets, sum everything above. Press Enter, and we'll select everything in rows 39 to 42. Highlight the projected period, and press Control R. PP&E, or property, plant, and equipment, will be calculated on a supporting schedule. So we have it highlighted purple as a reminder to revisit it later. And for total assets, we can take the formula already provided and paste across with Control R. Next, to project accounts payable, link to cost of goods sold, divide by 365 and multiply by AP days below. As before, select the projected period and press Control R. Line of credit and current maturities of long-term debt will be calculated on the debt schedule. So for now, we can take the formula for total current liabilities and paste it across the projected period. And of course, the balance of long-term debt net of current maturities will also pull from the debt schedule. So for the time being, we can take the formula for total liabilities and paste it across the projected period. Next, common stock and additional paid in capital will both be straight lined. And retained earnings is equal to retained earnings in the previous period plus net income on the income statement. In row 63, we have total equity, which is equal to the sum of all equity accounts. And in row 65, we have the sum of total liabilities and total equity. And as a last step, we'll carry the balance sheet check across the projected period. But keep in mind, we do not yet have a fully integrated model. So there should be no expectation that this will yet balance. By the time we complete the exercise, cash will pull from the cash flow statement, property, plant, and equipment will pull from the PP&E schedule, and the line of credit, current maturities of long-term debt, and long-term debt will all pull from the debt schedule. 
And if it's all done correctly, our balance sheet will balance, and you'll have a zero for every period in row 66. But for the time being, we're done with the balance sheet, and we can move on to the cash flow statement.